I've started to, yeah. Been work slowly, kind of working on stuff. Uh, wait, where are you based again? So usually Glasgow in Scotland, oh, but okay. I'm back in Aberdeenshire at the moment, which is kind of like northeast countryside. Oh, nice. I saw you. You played Glasgow. You played King Tut's mm-hmm. a while back. Yeah. How long ago was that? That must have been before with that first record. Yeah, that was in 2018. Feels like a different world. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was a fun show, though. Yeah, you always get a good crowd in there. It's got a lovely history as well. Yeah, I don't know that much about it, but um, I liked it. Yeah, it's kind of just like, it's like a rite of passage almost for a lot of British musicians on the rise. Everyone plays it. That's cool. You've uh, you supported Frightened Rabbit as well, right? Scottish band. Oh yeah, uh, I did. I opened for them at one time. Um, when was that? That was a while ago. That was probably five years ago. Wow. So like 2016, 2015? Yeah, 20, it was either 2016 or 17. Where were you? Did you part of the first DP at that point? Uh, yeah. Had you, when you started putting out stuff as cut worms, was that after you moved to New York? Um, I had started to put stuff out under that name while I was in, still in Chicago. But yeah, it, it didn't really start getting any, uh, any steam until I moved here to New York. Were the cassettes you did in Chicago? Yeah, I did the cassette there. I saw you recently passed a year since you quit smoking. Oh, yeah. How are you finding it? Uh, it's, you know, I'm, I'm, I feel better, I've, I think. <laughs> it's like, uh, it's all kind of relative at this point. It's definitely uh, one less thing to, like, worry about and like hate myself for doing um was it fairly easy to stop did you have a few kind of stop and starts or did you just stop and that was it well you know i've over the years i've kind of stopped and started a number of times i I was never really that heavy a smoker like i was never like a pack a day or anything i would i would have like at most like four or five unless i was like going out uh you know for a big night on the town or whatever the drinking would make it you know you could go through a almost a whole pack in a night and then you feel really wow. awful yeah does that not make your hangovers a lot worse i think it does make it worse um the smoking but i yeah i haven't haven't had it too bad do you still still drink or do you are you no i still have a drink every now and then what's your drink of choice i don't know like usually just like i'll i'll just have a beer or something or um last summer i was kind of getting into like uh different ciders because the beer was getting a a bit heavy i yeah i don't know i kind of just will um Go through phases. Just have a bear stick on a record, something like that. Yeah. How come you stopped smoking this time? It was really due to just the pandemic. I mean, like when that that whole thing started, it was just like I don't know how everyone else um, took it, but like those few, those first like few weeks and month, like the first month or two in the beginning, there, like before we really knew anything, you know, I was afraid that I could just die from this thing, you know? I don't know, I was kind of, it was kind of just fear <laughs> that helped me quit, I think, just because I, I don't know, I thought, obviously it's like a, the COVID is like a, deals with your lungs and stuff, so I figured anything like that, you wouldn't want to be making it worse by smoking or your chances worse. Yeah, I always find that strange, pretty much. I mean, at the start and all the way through the pandemic that, They've never really pushed the just get healthier thing. Right. If you, I mean, obesity and smoking are the two things that really increase your kind of chances of dying from this thing. Mm-hmm. But they've never really promoted just try and get a little healthier and it'll do you a lot of good. Yeah, you're right. I, I haven't heard a lot of that. Um, but that's a good point. They should be saying that. I guess that, yeah, it's interesting. I was, um, I was enjoying the video for Sold My Soul. Which features your uncle smoking, I think. Is it your uncle? Yeah. <laughs> Looking pretty cool. 
Yeah, he, I mean, he's like a chain smoker. He's been since like the 70s, I'm sure. Uh, wow. So, or the 80s or, or whenever. Um, Were you close with him growing up? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I've never lived close to him really, but we would, when we took family vacations um, down to Oklahoma to visit like my grandparents, um, he lives, has lived down there most of that time or most of my life and I would see him then but uh yeah we, I always had kind of a special connection with him is Oklahoma is that like Midwest I don't know my American geography too well uh it's like you could call you could maybe call it Midwest but it's it's more like Southwest it's like bordering on like Texas and um New Mexico and uh, like that southwestern region towards Mexico. Mm. And where did you grow up? I grew up in Ohio, which is like northeast. Okay, so you're like opposite ends of the country. Yeah. Wow. How long did it take you to get to Oklahoma? From Ohio, it would it was like uh, anywhere between like 14 and 16 hour drive. <laughs> wow. Would you do that in a day? Yeah, anywhere between there. I, usually. It would be my dad driving, and he would he could do it, and he could do the full fourteen hours, which was pretty impressive. <laughs> <laughs> what would you do to keep yourself entertained? We had a pretty good setup, actually. We would we got one of those. Well, we had like a minivan, and we had one of those like power converter things you could plug into the cigarette lighter, and like a mini ten inch. TV screen with a VCR built in, so we would ha- like watch movies, like tapes. Sometimes later on, I think we even hooked up like the Super Nintendo to it, and like we're able to play some Mario. So, so we were pretty entertained most of the time, or you know, just listening to music, whatever. You said you always had a. A connection with your uncle. What? Why was that? You think? What was drawing you together? Uh, I don't know. Well, he's he's just sort of a kind of a just a special type of person. I think in general, like he's got a very uh, open, welcoming presence, personality, um, and also so he, you know he can talk to just about anyone. But uh, with me specifically, I don't know. He, I knew he also, he would have like the guitar around and that was kind of my first instance of seeing anyone play an instrument and I was just kind of uh, impressed by that. How old are you at that time? I mean, I was really young. I was probably, I, I can't remember the first time, but I've known him, you know, I've been, he's been around since I was a baby. It's funny how music, you know, when you're growing up, it almost seems to have this, like, mystical quality when other people play it. Uh-huh. Like, it's crazy. Like, when you see someone first play a guitar and they kind of conjure up this sound that is so beautiful to hear. Oh, yeah. It, it is definitely is like a magical kind of thing. When, when you put the last album out, I saw that you, you spoke a lot about, or you spoke a little bit about the importance of having other people who you trust involved with the process? I think you mentioned that your girlfriend, your manager, the players and the producers that were involved in the record. Uh When was the first time in your life you felt like you were fully surrounded with a really positive group of creative people? I don't know. Probably, you know, I've had like bits and pieces of it when when I was younger. But yeah, it's hard to say like when the... When the first time I've always had pretty like supportive people around me. I've also, as far as music goes, like in making music, I've been pretty on my own. A lot of the time I tend to work on my own and write by myself and, and do all the uh, overdubs and layering of stuff by myself. But so this t- this particular time, this last time in the studio, like it was good to just. I mean, I still did like most of the overdubs and everything, but at least having like live drums, you know, uh, the pr- producer Matt Ross Spang like getting sounds and stuff. It was just 
kind of, it was just a lot easier. I didn't have to think about that stuff. Did you have to do that on the first record? Um, well, I, the first one I recorded with uh, Jonathan Rado out in LA with his, in his like home studio there. It was a similar thing with him. Like uh, it was, he was like really easy to get along with. And I was like, we were kind of like immediately uh, like comfortable working. And um, I got all pretty much uh, all the songs done in like two weeks that I was there. But it was weird for me because I'd never gone somewhere else to record like that. I've never like, I was like, you know, the whole country away from my home for like two weeks, just like only doing the record. So then you don't really get to step away from it um, until you're done. So then when I came back, it was like, I kind of had some stuff I wanted to like redo and change. What sort of stuff? Oh, I don't know. Things that like performances of mine that I just wasn't happy with. I'd also never really like mixed a record. So I didn't really understand like how much goes into that and how much like a, the record can change just in the way that it's mixed. And I kind of like took it for granted that like ev- anyone would just know what, what I was like hearing in my head, like what I wanted to sound like. And I wasn't very good at like, I guess, communicating how like what I wanted on things. So it was kind of just a learning experience in that way. Did you feel like when you approached this new record, was your communication slightly different? Uh, yeah, kind of. I mean, well, a big thing is having like reference points that like, that you can, uh, communicate to people. Like if you want a certain, say like drum sound or something, you can play a song for some like a an example from a song that you like if the producer is good then they can get that sound or like pretty close to it in the past i don't know i, I never really thought to do that because uh, i partially because i didn't want to just like copy something like exactly but realistically you're never really gonna copy something exactly because you can't um, so it kind of always ends up being its own thing. Yeah, it's funny. I was speaking to a band on the podcast the other week and they were saying that every time they try and write a song, they think, right, we're going to, this time we're going to write a song that sounds like Tame Impala. Uh-huh. And then by the time they try and write a Tame Impala song, by the time they get to the end of it, it sounds nothing like Tame Impala because it's been filtered through them and kind of gone through their process and the way they work and it just ends up completely different. Right. Is, is that a similar thing with referencing? I think so, yeah. Where did you record this last one? Um, that, it was in Memphis, Tennessee at uh, Sam Phillips Studio. Sam Phillips Recording, Inc. How far is that from New York? That is pretty far. I, I flew down there. So it was, I mean, on a plane, it's not that far. It's like a few hours flight. Was that a similar thing to the first one in LA where you couldn't really escape it when you were in the process of it because you were far away from home again um yeah it was but also i i had i was like a little bit better prepared um mentally to deal with that so you know i was able to kind of have a little bit clearer vision and and know i knew like the the pitfalls like to look out for i guess what would those pitfalls be um i don't know just like get uh getting too maybe obsessive over like little things or like going into like a rabbit hole on something it's easy to do when you're in a studio especially like a studio like that where you could get like any kind of sound it's sort of like playing on one of those uh like the electronic keyboards that have all the different sounds on them like you kind of after a while at least this always happens to me like i'll just get lost in like playing with all the different sounds. And after a while, like if you're, if you don't have a clear idea of like what you want on something, you'll kind of just end up like dallying around with the different sounds and 
feel like you lose momentum. Are you more likely to end up unhappy with the final thing too? I think probably, yeah, because you sort you you end up getting like burnt out on the song itself. If you do start to feel burnt out by a song, what do you do? Do you kind of leave it to one side and try and come back to it later, or? Yeah, that's one way to to go. Uh, that usually helps to just kind of leave it alone for a while and come back to it. Yeah, that's that's usually what I do. Have you ever managed to push through it? Like feeling burnout and just kept going and get through that phase or does that not work? Um, yeah, I mean, I have. Um, I think it kind of usually comes in waves. It's like sometimes you can really push at something as hard as you can for a long time and, and it's still nothing comes of it and then you leave it alone and come back to it and keep working at it and it still doesn't seem right and it's you can do that any number of times um yeah a lot of times it's like you you could rework something a million different ways and it might not really be any better it just it's just different so there's i forget i think it was like picasso or some artist who had a, a quote that was like a, uh, a painting's never really done. It's like abandoned, which I can <laughs> I can relate to that. I think uh, I think Orson Welles maybe said the same thing about movies or something too. Uh-huh. At what point do you come to terms with that though? Because I feel like I don't know. Maybe you might not be the same, but when you're a younger artist, it kind of feels like that's a hard point to get to. Maybe that realization. I don't know. I mean, at a certain point, you just have to to do that because there's all you'll never get anything done if you uh if you don't realize that at a certain point you just have to let things go you used to did you not used to do an exercise where you would write like a couple songs every week like an a side and a b side like inspired by your roommate yeah yeah my um my roommate that i lived with in chicago james swanberg back in the day he was doing a project called today's hits where, where he would write a song every day. And a lot of time, you know, they would be, sometimes they would be like a minute long or, or some, you know, they, they weren't, they were kind of all over the place. It wasn't always just like, like a fully fleshed out thing. I got the idea from him to, to just try to be more productive in that way. Uh, I didn't do every day or even every week. I, I was trying to do release two songs like every month was what, what my sort of goal was. And I did that for a little while. Does that help you get through the, the kind of being quite precious about things and just learning that you have to get them to a good point and then abandon them? Like what we were saying? Uh, yeah, I mean, that that definitely worked in that way back then when I did that. Um, cause it, it was also like, there was really no pressure. Like nobody knew who I was and it, nobody was expecting anything from me. It wasn't like anyone was really listening anyways. So there wasn't really any pressure to like polish things too much or like, or really even worry at all <clears throat> about what anyone else might, how they might respond to it. It was just kind of doing it for myself, which is a pretty good place to be in for any kind of artist or musician. You'd be wise to kind of keep that outlook of like not doing it for anyone else, but yourself really. But that can become harder when, you know, there's like, for instance, a record label involved or, or, you know, not that I have like tons and tons of followers or whatever now, but there are at least some people who, who I know will listen to stuff when I put it out. So you can't help but kind of think about that sometimes, but I try not to think about that. I hardly ever think about that when I'm like writing or anything. Are the times that you think about that, maybe like when you're on the road or something and you see more people in the audience and stuff and you notice that audience kind of appearing? Yeah, I mean, really the only time that I would think about that sort of thing is really in just sort of uh, weaker, like superficial moments of like seeing someone else with like, who's maybe more successful than me or something like that, wondering at like, 
you know, what makes, so, what makes somebody popular and somebody else not popular uh, or like what, what causes somebody to, to get mom- like a, get traction or momentum in, in like the music industry. Cause it's really like ephemeral, uh, especially nowadays. It's kind of like, I don't really have any idea what people like or want, or especially people my own age. Yeah. I really have no idea what interests people as far as music goes it doesn't really even really make sense for me to try to to like appeal to a certain audience or whatever does that make you more free when you don't have that expectation are you i guess maybe it does but yeah there's always limitations that are kind of just imposed by um they're just naturally there i mean like i'm kind of limited by my own self of what what i can create or or just what i like really because i i just try to make stuff that that i like that i would like does your perception on it change at all when somebody else likes it too yeah i mean it makes you feel good when somebody else likes it but uh, i'm not sure if it if it changes my perception that of it that much how much did you tour between the first and second record well, for the first record in 2018 was like the main, my main like big year of touring. I, I did some touring before that, like just little stints. But 2018 was like kind of the big push where it was like pretty much that whole year from January to like the end of October, I was pretty much on the road that almost that whole time. As far as this record, the the latest record, there's been no touring because of COVID. But um, did you just do the one American tour off the first one or a couple? A couple. I went to Europe twice and went around America, I think, twice. But I mean, both of the albums kind of feel rooted in American culture. Did your understanding of America change from seeing it in a much broader way when you're traveling through it like that on a couple of tours? Um, yeah, I mean, you can't help but but get a different perspective when you're doing that, going from city to city, day to day, um, just because you you start like subconsciously even just seeing that he, the you know, people in places are have a lot of similarities. The culture of America doesn't change all that much. Like there, there still are differences regionally in the country, but um, and like geographically, things look different, uh, which is cool about this country because there's a lot of different variations and different types of scenery and stuff. <laughs> but um, you know, there's. It's it's still more or less the same type of uh, attitudes that you run into. I imagine that could be kind of unifying in a way. The one, I mean, I, I imagine when you're touring it, that's quite a divided time, or it felt like it from across the pond. It looked quite divided, but maybe it feels a little bit more similar. Yeah, I mean, it it certainly has been pretty div- divided for a while. Um, yeah, at at any point when um, Donald Trump was president, it certain, especially in certain parts of the country, it, it was certainly very, very divided. Still is, even though he's out. But he, you know, him being in the White House uh, had a very divisive, polarizing effect, among other things. Is he still in the news over there? Is he kind of vanished for the meantime? He's thankfully kind of gone away because kind of been like banned from most <laughs> uh, <laughs> social media or, or any way of like getting his voice out there. But it, it does make one kind of nervous or worry because he's just not the sort of person that wants to be shut up. 
you can just imagine him sitting in his evil lair like a Bond villain. Right, yeah. <laughs> Did you used to write in Soundcheck when you were touring? Not with any real intention. That was, during Soundcheck was kind of the only time that I would get a chance to just like mess around without thinking too much. So you know, some there were probably some songs that emerged out of you know stuff I did just playing around during sound checks. But usually I don't know. I kinda need to be at home and have like extended periods of time by myself to like write anything of merit. Do you need silence to write? Uh, it helps. Do things just seem a little clearer when it's there? Yeah, I mean, naturally, if you don't have a million other things going on, it, you can focus a little bit more. Well, melodies and lyrics come to you in silence, or do you need to be on an instrument for them to start appearing? It, it varies. It kind of, It's different every time, really. Do you ever still transcribe lyrics on a typewriter? I don't currently have a typewriter. I, <clears throat> the one that I had was in storage at my, back at my parents' house now. So usually I'll just write, uh, I'll type stuff on my computer, I'll use like the notes thing on my phone or write stuff down in, my, in a notebook. And is that you writing it down once it's there or is that you writing it down as it's coming to you? Both, I guess. I don't know. Sometimes, well, most of the whole point of writing anything down is just so you don't forget it. So I guess it's, it's usually that. And then I'll just write something down if I think of it and I don't want to forget it. And then I'll usually like kind of tinker away at stuff or assemble pieces of things afterwards. Can you sculpt something like melody or does it arrive fully formed no it a lot of times lately i feel like the more that you do it certain things will come fully formed um sometimes the whole thing can come fully formed but more often you'll get something going and then maybe a part of it you'll realize is that you've taken, you've stolen from something else subconsciously. You either have to abandon it or change it so that it's not stolen anymore. Uh, and so there's there's a process of of doing that. It's like a, I guess you could call that sculpting it. It's kind of moving things around to where there's still having the effect of moving you or whatever, but also not not just straight up stealing things. Yeah, that sounds tricky because if the spark of, what's, of it and what's making you feel something has come from something that you would regard as maybe a little bit too close to someone else's work, mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you change it without inhibiting the thing that's moving you in the first place? It's tricky because sometimes... You know, maybe the thing that's making you feel good about that particular thing isn't yours, so you don't have a a right to take it. But sometimes it it will lead you to something else um, that it, that's exciting, and you don't have to get hung up on you know like wishing that you had written something uh, that somebody else did. With what we were saying about melody just a few moments ago too and, and how to some extent you can sculpt it and change it a little bit, this last record that you put out is a very bright record melodically. Is that something that you're consciously putting into it or does that just come out naturally? Do they just form in that way? Yeah, well, that's good to hear. Um, it's not, no, it's not really like, <clears throat> conscious i guess is more just um just what happened is that i mean another word that gets thrown around the record a lot is nostalgia mm -hmm. is that a, is that a similar thing is that just an inevitable byproduct of certain sounds is it something or is it something that you can consciously control that feeling of nostalgia 
Uh, I guess it depends. You know, there's like the the lyrical content or like the actual sounds that you're referring to. But yeah, it's like it's been a big, I guess, point of contention with myself or people that have certainly people that have reviewed my music that that tend to say that it's like retro or old feeling uh, or sounding, which you know, it's kind of like a it's hard for me to say it's like i do mainly like old music so it makes sense that the things that i make if i'm making something that i you know like or would want to like that it might kind of sound like that and like the structures of songs um uh, i just have an affinity for a certain type of song. I usually, I don't hear a lot of people doing nowadays. So I tend to gravitate towards the older stuff. I still do. Sometimes I will hear stuff that people do, you know, nowadays that, that strikes me and that I like, but there's far less of it than there is of the older stuff. When you said that that can be a point of contention sometimes in your music, what exactly did you mean? Well, I don't know. Like it, it's more just a personal thing of like, it's like a, yeah, I don't know, like an ego thing of just like as a modern, whatever contemporary musician or artist, one wants to feel like they're making something that's new and relevant. So it, it kind of comes off as maybe not an insult, but um, just kind of like disappointing, like to to think that what you're making is just like rehashing something that's already been done, or you know, or, or for or it's not like relevant or something, or it's somehow less relevant than other music that that has the, the trappings of <clears throat> something more modern like uh but usually i don't know in my opinion most of that is it's kind of just like instrumental and production choices less it's less about the actual content yeah i'd agree because i mean you use the word relevant there and a lot of your music lyrically in terms of what it's looking at thematically it feels very present feels like it very much exists now. Mm-hmm. Well, that's good to hear. That's kind of the juxtaposition at the heart of it, though, I guess, isn't it? Slightly nostalgic sounds, contra- using them in an effective way to talk about a present time that we're maybe not particularly nostalgic for, or won't be particularly nostalgic for. Sure. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's I guess, an accurate description of some of the stuff, I would say. It's interesting to think about, actually. Do you think anyone would ever look back on 2020 and or 2021 and say, oh, I wish I was back there living in that time? Uh, I'm sure some somebody will. It's, uh, that's just kind of how things go. It's just like there's something about the past that people end up just romanticizing kind of. Uh, I mean, even like the early 2000s or the 90s now, it's like everybody – wishes it was back then but i think that's just a natural thing it's like especially when you grow up in a certain time you just everybody kind of longs for their childhood um or those the times when they were like really happy as a child some people don't have happy childhoods but most i feel like most people it's like a psychological there's like a safety in when you were younger yeah i guess part of it is that people just want to have more time as well yeah that like, they want to have their whole lives in front of them sure yeah and less responsibilities things like that i suppose i mean you're saying the early 90s early 2000s there you must get that even more so if you're in new york when the kind of whole rock scene was booming at that time for the city yeah i mean i wasn't here uh, at that time i was i was still in Ohio um, but yeah there there certainly was a lot going on here at that time 
but it's like by the time I got here, you know, from my understanding anyways, it's and things that people have told me, the city ha- had changed pretty dramatically even since then. I mean, this city has transformed a number of times in the past in the past few decades. In what way? Uh, in every way, really, I think. I mean, different types of people and um, things that are going on, different businesses and... Like gentrification and things. Yeah. Yeah. I guess that was kind of what Giuliani started, wasn't it? The whole commercialization of it and selling it as like a tourist hotspot. Yeah, that was kind of the beginning of it. How come you chose to move to New York? I don't know. It just... Well, it was really my girlfriend's idea to move to New York. I had always kind of wanted to live there. Kind of seems like seemed like the place to be if you wanted to like try to make anything happen for yourself. It was either that or L.A., um, at least in this country. Would you ever go to L.A.? Would you ever move? Um, maybe. Uh, it's expensive, though, and it's pretty far away from both of our families so I'm not sure did um you were saying you know with your girlfriend's idea there is she on the record does she do like a lot of the backing vocals and stuff yeah she does some on the on the record so did she go with you to Tennessee uh no that was done afterwards like I when we came I came back to New York and did you go into a studio in New York no I just um recorded it myself oh wow do you is that do you kind of embe- no, em, yeah kind of add like the little flourishes and embellishments to the mixes from home? Yeah, and with this record, I did a lot of that. I after I came back from the studio, I I added a lot of the um, like fleshing out of stuff. You're a, you're an illustrator too, right? Yeah. Do you feel like you have a natural attention to detail in that way? Um, Those little idiosyncratic bits that just help to make it feel more real and personal. Yeah, I mean, I I do have a, I don't know if it's, if you could call it like a good attention to detail. It's more like just be being like obsessive of certain types of detail, which yeah, there's that does show itself in in like illustration stuff. Does that manifest itself in your life anywhere without outside your art? I don't know. You'd probably have to ask somebody else around me. <laughs> Do you read a lot? Yeah. I, um, I try to always be reading something. Is that something you've done since you were young? Probably since high school is when I first started like seriously reading. What are you reading at the, at the moment? Reading a few things, but I just started um, the Q Team eighty four, the Haruki Murakami novel, which uh, I I like that a lot so far. Do you take inspiration from writers and novelists in that way, in the same way that you take inspiration from songwriters? Um, yeah, I think so. In a different way, maybe it's kind of. I don't know, with novels a lot, it's sort of like, I feel like that's the only medium where you can really like get into somebody else's head, like borrow someone else's consciousness. So it's more of like a point of view type of thing that you're maybe co-opting or seeing or, or being inspired from. I mean, it's interesting to think about because you quite often tell stories in your songs. Like there might often be like a linear thread that kind of goes through it Uh in that way. Are you trying to imbue it with a similar personal thing to what you were saying there about a novel and the way that you can kind of see someone else's point of view? Or do you view them more just as stories from a third person perspective? Uh, I think it can vary. It can be, it can be both or either or, or neither sometimes. What would it would be if it was neither? I don't know. It could be uh, from the perspective of a tree or something. I don't know. <laughs> like uh, you ever see that film, A Ghost Story? I don't think so. It's kind of about a guy who dies and becomes a ghost, and then the whole film is him watching the world go by 
where he can't interact with anything. And he's just watching as a perspective as a ghost. It's really good. Mm, I'll have to it kind check of that out. looks at the passing of time and stuff too. It's interesting. What? what can you write stories outside of songs? Um, I've tried a little bit, but um, I would need to like take some kind of class, I think, to like give myself any kind of. I need. I would need to learn like structure and things, and like how how to like build a a narrative in that way. Like uh, sometimes I'll write just like little short scenes of of something that I'll think about, but I, I've never been able to really like complete a whole story. Yeah, the f- there's di- well, like you say you'd have to learn structures. There's different techniques to it to make it effective and satisfying. Mm-hmm. Did you do that when you first started songwriting? Were there conscious structures that you kind of looked at and examined and tried to play with and experiment and utilize? Probably. I didn't, I don't know if I really thought about it in those terms, but it was just kind of more of a natural process of just listening to things and trying to figure, figure out how, how things work. What do you think about in life outside of music most what do you think about most in life outside of music i don't know that's a tough one it's like what does anybody think about a million things at once yeah (laughs) (laughs) something existential probably yeah you open the album with the line back in the golden years Uh, what would you consider to be your golden years what would you classify as that i don't know right now probably i'm pretty pretty happy with uh, how things are right now is it easy to be present and appreciate it then i don't know if it's easy but um it's best if you can 